Thank you for checking out our sermon here at New Grace. We are excited that you came across this message and are tuning in. It is our prayer that it is a blessing to you. We just want to make you aware of a couple things before we get to the message. First, we would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook at New Grace BC. Also, be sure to check out our website, reachingroanoke.com. There, you can find out more about who we are and where we are going as a church. Again, thank you for checking out our sermon here at New Grace. Please let us know of any questions you may have or any way that we can help you and your family. Enjoy the message. So for the last four weeks, we've been looking at this series entitled Established. And we've been looking how we as believers can be rooted and established in a relationship with God and with the love of God. And so we said that the first thing we need to do to become established in the love of God is we have to know God. And this, this is more than just knowing about God. It's more than just understanding the, the thing, the Bible verses, what they say about God. It's more than just knowing the history of the Bible, the theology of the Bible. It is having an intimate, personal relationship with God. See, Jesus, while he was on earth, said eternal life is not somewhere we go when we die. He said eternal life is knowing God the Father. And that word know that he uses there is the same word he uses about when Adam and Eve knew each other. And in the, in the New Testament, he talks about knowing a spouse. It is an intimate relationship. It's a personal relationship. It's an open and honest relationship. And so if we're going to be established in God's love, we have to know God. And that's, that requires a few things. First of all, it requires that we, we listen to God. See, God speaks to his children. Today, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. So the issue today is not that God doesn't speak anymore like he used to speak in the Old Testament. God still speaks to us every day very clearly. He speaks through his word. He speaks through authorities in our life. He speaks through godly friends and relationships. He speaks through the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us. And so God speaks to us. The issue is the enemy also speaks to us. The enemy lies to us. The enemy tries to deceive us. So if we're going to know God and we're going to be established in God's love, we've got to learn to recognize the voice of God as well as recognize the voice of the enemy and we obey God. Then we said not only do we have to listen to God, we've got to learn to talk to God. We talk to God through prayer. And honestly, and even in biblical Christianity and true believers like we are here, prayer sometimes can become a ritual. It can become a religious exercise we go through because people said you got to pray. And so you got your prayer list, you got your prayer time, you got your prayer place, which are good and necessary. But prayer isn't a religious ritual. Prayer is a conversation with your loving Heavenly Father that wants you to talk to Him. He wants to get involved in every aspect of your life. He wants you to be open and honest with Him. You know, silly, uh, really a th- silly thing that we as believers do when we talk to God, we pray almost like we're trying to impress God. We use these big words, oh, Heavenly Father, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, he who always was and is and shall ever be. And we, we use these big phrases in theology to impress God, and, and we, we don't really like to be honest with God. You know, I know, we, I know you do it because I've done it. When you start confessing your sin, sometimes you leave some out because you hope God doesn't really know about that one. But he does. Or maybe you keep it out because you want to keep doing it. We've all done it. And so to talk to God, we've got to be open and honest with God. 
We've got to let God into every aspect of our life and obey his leading. Then we said the next step is to, to knowing God and being established in his love is serving God. The final night of his time on earth before his crucifixion, Jesus served his disciples. He washed their, their feet, and their feet were disgusting. They were covered in dirt and mud and fecal matter and all kinds of gross stuff. And here's the creator of the universe humbling himself and wrapping himself in a towel. And with the towel he's wearing, clean the feet of these men who would betray him, who would deny him, who would doubt him, who would abandon him. But he humbled himself and he served them. And we serve God by serving others. And then, of course, we saw that last week we saw that we, to be established in a relationship with God, we have to walk with others that help us walk with God. This takes humility and it takes trust. It's a willingness to let other godly believers know you're not okay. That you're not all right. And we're not good at that because we, we put on our clothes, we dress the part, we do our hair nice, we come to church, and people say, how are you? Oh, I'm great, but your, your life's falling apart. And we need other believers that when they say, hey, how are you doing? We can say, I'm not doing so good. I've got some issues I'm struggling with. I've got some burdens I'm carrying, and I need some help. Because here's the thing, none of us are okay. We all have burdens. We all have trials. We all have difficulties that we're going through. And God gave us each other to help us as we serve him. So it's okay to not be okay. And we have other believers that we can tell that to and get the help we need to help us walk with God. Today we're going to wrap up this series by looking at the final step in being established in the love of God. And that is sharing God. The passage we're going to look at today in Matthew 28 is known as the Great Commission. It is God's final word to mankind, to his followers, to his believers, to his disciples. It's the final word he gave them before he ascended to heaven. He's died on the cross. He's been buried in a borrowed tomb. He's risen from the grave. He's made himself known to his disciples and his followers. And he spent 40 days with them. And now he is standing on the Mount of Olives. He's getting ready to ascend back to heaven to sit next to the Heavenly Father. And look what he says in Matthew 28, starting in verse number 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when, Jesus, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. This verse right here, it amazes me. I just, I don't understand the ones that doubted. They saw Jesus die on the cross. They saw Jesus have his, his, his heart punctured by the Roman spear as he was thrust through his side. They knew he was dead. They saw him get buried in a borrowed tomb. They all saw the empty tomb. They all saw the risen Savior physically spend time with them for 40 days. And we know it wasn't just a spiritual resurrection because when he makes himself known to Peter and then when they're fishing, he's eating on the shore and spirits don't need to eat. We know he's a physical body because when Thomas showed up and the night, the week before, Thomas said, I'm not going to believe until I poke my hand through his, his the holes of his hands and put my fingers in his side. When Pete, Thomas showed up, Jesus said, hey, touch me, feel me, put your fingers in my wounds, put your hand in my side because I am physically risen from the dead. They've seen him alive. They know that it's a miracle. They know it's the Messiah. And some of them worshipped him and believed him. But others still doubted. Whenever God is moving, there will be those that do and those that doubt. There will be those that recognize it's God and worship God for what he's doing and those that say, well, this is just, I don't know. Doesn't make sense to me. It's different. I don't like it. And so there will be doers and doubters. Don't be a doubter. Be a doer for the work of God. 
It has nothing to do with my sermon. Just want to throw that in there. Back to the Bible. Verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, and them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Again, powerful truth of Jesus. Jesus says, hey, all power in heaven and earth. He's not just saying, hey, I'm the, I'm the king of Israel. I've got the all power over Israel or I've got all power over the eastern hemisphere. He says, all power in heaven and all power in earth is mine. He is telling them once again, I am God. I am God in the flesh. I'm the creator of everything. I have all power and all authority over everything and all matters, no matter who it is. Look at verse number 19. So he's, already, so he's saying, I've got the power. I've got the authority. Verse 19, go ye therefore. So when he's, he's saying, what he's, he's giving them a command, and he's already said, I've got the authority to tell you to do this. I've got all authority over every issue in heaven and every issue in earth. Go ye therefore. Because I have the authority, I'm telling you to go. Go ye therefore. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Think about Jesus' time on earth for a minute. Of course, his birth was incredible. He's born of a virgin in a manger in Bethlehem. The only people there were the shepherds who the angels spoke about. Of course, the angels came and worshipped him and and all had the heavens opened up and they were singing about his his birth and the star showed up and then three years later, the wise men showed up as getting you ready for Christmas when you put your nativity scene out. Put the wise men far away. They got there later. That's the here, they're there. But so Jesus' birth was an incredible event, but it wasn't really well known around the world or around Jerusalem. But his ministry was different. He shows up at the age of 30, starts gathering disciples, starts teaching, starts performing miracles. First miracle, he goes to a wedding and turns water into wine. And then his his miracles just get even more and more incredible after that. He causes the blind to see. The deaf are able to hear. The lame are able to walk. He heals lepers. Leprosy was was a death sentence. There was no cure. Once you were, were, were diagnosed with leprosy, you were cast out of the society because you were so contagious and so unclean. No one can have anything to do with you. And here, Jesus goes to these unclean, helpless people and he heals them. He raises the dead. He feeds thousands of people with a little boy's lunch. He walks on water. He does, he teaches thousands. He's taught incredible lessons. He's taught incredible truths. He's arrested. He's crucified on a cross. He's buried in the grave for three days. And on the third day, he rises again, redeeming mankind with God the Father. Then, in his resurrected body, he spends 40 days with his disciples. 40 days with his followers, teaching them more truth, teaching them things they needed to go. And now he's standing on the Mount of Olives. He's looking at his followers. He's about to ascend up to heaven, and he's giving them one final instruction. He's giving them one final command. What he is telling his disciples now is what he wants them to, to understand and the truth he wants him to, to focus on after he goes. Because this truth, he's going to give him a command, and he's going to float to heaven. He knows they are always going to remember this. They are always going to remember this lesson here. Because, I mean, in, in school, if your teacher is just teaching you lessons, they can be important lessons, but you typically, typically don't remember most of them. But if your teacher teaches you a lesson and then floats away that lesson's going to stick in your mind. You're going to remember that. And so Jesus is is giving one final lesson, one final command, and he's going to ascend. So this is what he wants his disciples to know the most. This moment is a big deal. 
This was the culmination of all his time on earth. He could have taught them or told them anything. But what he does is give a final command before he leaves. He says, I want you to go. I want you to make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I want you to teach them everything I have taught you. I want you to teach them to obey. And as you go and do this, I will be with you. Then he floats away. So since this is the final command of Jesus on earth, it's pretty important. But it wasn't just important to those gathered on the Mount of Olives. It's important for us today. So we need to understand what Jesus is saying here. So this passage, it gives us the final command of Jesus, and it teaches us some vital truths. But to understand them, we've got to answer a few questions. So here's the first question. What is the command? What is the command? Jesus begins by saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. There are two aspects to this final command. Go and teach. So he says, go and teach. Now the phrase, go ye therefore, literally means as you are going. See, we think of go, it's like, okay, I'm going to go here, I'm going to get in my car, I'm going to go there. When I get there, I'm there. But this go ye therefore means as you are going through life. As you're going to work. As you raise your kids. As you love your spouse. As you go shopping. As you go to the gym, or if you're like me, as you say, I need to go to the gym. As you go to school, as you go through life, we're to fulfill this command. We are to be obeying Jesus as we go through our life. But what are we supposed to be doing? He goes, go ye therefore and teach all nations. The word teach is the Greek word mathatio. And it literally means to make a disciple of one. But what is a disciple? Literally speaking, a disciple is a follower of a teacher. It's a pupil. So a disciple of Jesus is someone who follows the teachings of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is someone who has met Jesus. Someone who follows Jesus. And someone who knows Jesus. As a believer, as a church, we are disciples. If you're a believer this morning, you've met Jesus. Now, I know you haven't met him face to face, but you've met Jesus. That's what salvation is, is meeting Jesus and understanding that you're a sinner and he's the Savior and putting your faith and trust in his death, burial, and resurrection as payment for your sins. And you can't do that unless you meet him. So you've met Jesus. You know Jesus as you study his word and listen to preaching and teaching and learn about him. And hopefully, you follow Jesus. So as a disciple, as a believer, as a church... It is our duty to help people meet Jesus. To help people know Jesus. And to teach people to follow Jesus. It is our duty and the final command of our Savior that we go and make disciples. As we go through life, we're to introduce people to Jesus. We're to teach people about Jesus. We're to let them know about Jesus and help them obey Jesus. That is the command. But that brings us to the second question. Number two, who is the subject of the command? Who's this command directed? What's the subject? What's the point of it? What's the main issue of this command? The subject of the command, the main focus of this command is the word them. Look at verse number 19 again. <coughs> Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing who? Them. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching, teaching them to observe all things. All right, we need to be more responsive here. Baptizing who? Yeah. Teaching who? Yeah. Them. 
Great. The subject is the word them. We are supposed to make disciples of them. We are supposed to baptize them. Who is them? <laughs> no, it's not us. So who is the them? As a believer, them is anyone who is not us. So we're believers, we're us. We're the church. We've met Jesus. We know Jesus. We follow Jesus. We're us. Them is anyone who's not us. It's people who don't know Jesus. It's people who haven't met Jesus. It's people that don't obey Jesus. So the command is to go to them. As believers, we are the you in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever, whatsoever I have commanded you. So we're the you, they're the them. So it's us and them. But you used to be a them. Every one of us here. You were a them. You've not always been an us. Oh, but preacher, I was... Raised in church. My parents brought me to church since the day I was born, and I, I grew up in church, and I went through Sunday school, and I've, I've gone through the children's program, and I've, I've gone through the teen program, and I've been in the door, and I've always been a faithful church. I was, I was born in church, and I was raised in church, and I'm going to die in church. So I've always been a them. No, you a us. No, you haven't. You were a them. I don't care how religious your upbringing is, you were a them. Then you met Jesus. You got to know Jesus. You started to follow Jesus. You became an us. So us and them. We used to be a them. We were born of them. We were a them, but now we're an us. The problem facing modern Christianity and a lot of churches today is we don't focus a lot on them because we're so concerned about us. We're so concerned about us. What can we do for us to make our experience better, to make us more happy, to make us more comfortable, to make us appear better, to make us appear more. And so we focus so much on us that we forget about them. And as a church, we are so focused on us that we don't obey the command to go to them, to introduce them to Jesus, to teach them, to disciple them. But the last thing our Savior said before he left heaven, was stop thinking about us and start going to them. Stop focusing on us and start going after them. So we're supposed to baptize them, to teach them, to make disciples out of them, and with the help of Jesus, help them become an us. This is the mission of God. This is the mission of the church. This is why the church exists. Not for us, for them. See, the church isn't a building we come to and sit in and, and look nice and sing songs and give money and listen to sermons and go home and say, Amen, I was glad I went to church today. That's not what the church is. The church is a movement that you choose to be a part of to help people meet Jesus, get to know Jesus, and obey Jesus. When most believers think about missions work and missionaries, we think about the work that happens across the world. But missions isn't something that only happens across the world. It also happens across the street. It isn't an either or. It's both. In Acts chapter 1, the Bible says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Both means at the same time. So Jesus was saying, you're going to get power, and then you're going to be a witness for me in Jerusalem. And while you're being a witness for me in Jerusalem, you're going to be a witness for me in Judea. And while you're being a witness for me in Jerusalem and Judea, you're going to be a witness for me in Samaria. And while you're being a witness for me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, you're going to be a witness for me all across the world. At the same time. Time. Now, Jerusalem was the city that they lived in. It was the city they worked in. It was the city where they went to school, where they did life. It was their 
community. It was occupied by their friends and their family and their loved ones. People they did life with on a daily basis. Judea was the area or the country that Jerusalem was in. It was considered a southern kingdom. It was their nation. It was their homeland. It was inhabited by the Jews, their people. So go to their community. Go to their neighborhoods. Go to their cities. And while they're doing that, go to their country. Go to the nation they live in. But then he said also Samaria. Now Samaria was considered the northern kingdom. It was part of Israel, but in this time, it was considered a different country. It was considered a neighboring country. It was inhabited by the Samaritan people. The Samaritan people were people who were the offspring of the Jews who had conquered the land and the Gentile nations they refused to to banish from the land. These two groups of people got together, married, and they had these Samaritans. So they were half Jew, half Gentile. The Jews hated them. They avoided Samaria all the time. That's why it was so important when Jesus is going, he goes, I must have needs to go through Samaria. Because no Jew went through Samaria. They hated Samaria. And so now Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to go there. I want you to go to your city, your community, your neighborhoods. I want you to go to your nation, your country. I want you to go to people you don't like, people you don't get along with. Then he says, he included those they did life with daily. Then he says to go to the, 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 to the uttermost parts of the world. This included everyone else. So Jesus is telling this first group of believers, this first church, that they were to make disciples of everyone in the world at the same time. He include, included those they did life with daily. He included the people, their own people, outside their community. He included those people they didn't really like. And he included everyone else in the world. So how do we do this? Well, world missions is number one. Because we can't go to our country at the same time. We can't go to the nations across the world at the same time. We we can't go everywhere at once, so we send others to go. So we as a church determine, hey, we want to go here. So we look for people and commission people and send people to go where we can't go. We financially support them. But don't forget about the people across the street. Don't forget about the people in our Jerusalem, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our communities. So at the same time, not just those across the world and across the country, but those across the street and those across the dinner table. The church is the only hope for the world. The church is the only plan God has to change the world one them at a time. So if you're a believer, you've got some work to do. You have the responsibility to go to them and help make them in us. This is a huge responsibility. It's an enormous task, and honestly, it's impossible without God. Which brings us to the final question, number three, how do we do this? That's why the end of verse 20 is so important and so incredible. Jesus said, I am with you always. When I've always read this verse, I've always figured, you know, I'm with you always. Of course, we're reading, you know, the King James. It's a, it's a, a translation from the original text. And, of course, it's, it's in Old English language. And so it's a language we don't even, it's a translated from a dead language to a language we don't even speak today. So when I thought, he said, I just thought, I'm with you always. Now, if I were to say I'm with you always, what do you think that means? He's always with you, right? Jesus is with you always. So when we think of the word always, we think of all the time. But that's not what the word means. In the Greek, it literally means individually and as a whole. So that means as a church, Jesus is with us. But as a believer, Jesus is with me. Not just collectively as a church to help the church do what the church needs to do, but to help me as a believer do what I have to do. Jesus is with us as a church 
to reach them, but he's also with me and you as an individual to help us reach them. We are never alone on this mission. We are never on our own. We always have Jesus with us, helping us, guiding us, directing us. You know, and Jesus taught this to his disciples long before this statement. In Luke chapter 12, he says, And when they bring you up into the synagogues and into the magistrates and the powers, take you no thought or what you shall think you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour What you ought to say. Then in Matthew 10, he says, But when they deliver you up, take no thought or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh through you. Jesus gave us this command to reach them, to teach them, to introduce them to Him, but He also promised to give us the words to say to introduce them to us. He doesn't send us out there on a solo mission to fulfill this task. He's taken away every excuse we can think of to ignore this command. Oh, I'm too shy. You've got Jesus' spirit in you and his courage can work through you. Well, I don't know who we're to try to reach. Well, Jesus' wisdom is in you to show you who he wants you to go to to try to teach them about him. Well, I don't know what to say. He speaks through you. You don't have to know what to say. Jesus will speak through you, giving us the words to say to reach them and teach them. God is with his children. He is always with us as a church but he's also with you, each and every one of us. He is with us to help us obey his final command. He is with us to help make disciples. He is with us to go to them and help them be in us. We are not on a solo mission. We have help with us to accomplish the mission that God has called us to. So why are we doing it? I'm not just speaking to you, I'm speaking to me. I've got no excuse, you've got no excuse. Why are we so focused on us when God God said, don't worry about you, go to them. Who has God placed in my life that's a them that he's supposed to use me to make an us? Who has God placed in your life that's a them that he wants to use you to introduce them to him, to teach them about him, to help them obey him so that they can become part of us? Why are we so focused on us when we should be focused on them? You know, being established in the love of God, it isn't something that is hard to do but it requires us taking the right steps toward him. We have to know him personally. Personally and intimate. We have to have a relationship with him. We have to have met him. We have to know him and we have to obey him to be established. But Jesus said that knowing him and knowing God is what eternal life is. It's not a destination, it's a relationship. And being established in his love means listening to him talking to him, serving him, obeying him, and walking with others that help us walk with him. But it doesn't stop there. It also means we are to introduce others to him. And here's the thing. If we're not helping introduce other people to Jesus, then we're not obeying him. Because it's his final command. Now look, I know this is daunting and sometimes it's scary. You know, because you talk about this and people think, oh, he's talking about door to door soul winning, going door to door, knocking on door. And look, are, is door to door soul winning effective? Sometimes. There are Philippian jailers out there where if you knock on the door and say, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? They've already been t- thinking about it and the Holy Spirit's been moving. And they're like, oh, yes, what must I do to be saved? But most people who you can introduce to Jesus, it's people that you have a relationship with already, that you do life with. That they, they know who you are. They know you've been changed by knowing him. So, number one, be changed by knowing him. Act like a believer. But then God puts these people in your life 
for you to reach. Look, there are no coincidences. There are no just, oh, that's just, that's just kind of a, an association I have. That's just a, you know, it's just a Facebook friend, not really a friend. I don't really, they're just a, you know, not, somebody I don't really know really well. If you know them and they're in your life, God put them there for a purpose. They are there for you to turn them into an us. And if we're not doing that, we're not obeying. We are to help people meet Jesus, know Jesus, and obey Jesus. That is our mission. That's why Jesus left us here. That's why as soon as you accept God as your Savior, you're not sucked up into heaven immediately. Because you're left here to help reach other people. You're left here to help turn them into us. But we're not alone in this task. We have an incredible partner in Jesus. He is always here, always with us. His Spirit is with us, guiding us, telling us what to say, to be established in God's love. We have to share that love with others so they can be established too. Are we sharing God like we're supposed to?